Hello everyone! Welcome to our Spiderwick Fairy Crafting Party. Our first virtual program of the summer. And there'll be a lot more uh, virtual programs coming up this summer on our YouTube channel, so stay tuned for more. Well, normally at this time, uh, we'd be making fairy houses in the forest as part of our forest story time. Uh, unfortunately, this year, that story time isn't happening, but you can still make fairy houses in your own backyard or on a forest trail or path. So we're going to begin by reading one of our favorite forest story time books, Fairy Houses by Tracy Kane. And in this book, you'll learn the rules of the forest, the rules of making fairy houses. This summer, my parents decided we should leave the city and spend a week on a small island off the coast of Maine. They said that there was something special for me on the island, something I would really like, but they wouldn't tell me what it was until we got there. As soon as we got off the boat, I tried to guess. Is it the lighthouse? Those silly sandpipers on the beach? The seals? Our cottage? Later, when we went for a walk in the woods by our cottage, I discovered the secret my parents had been keeping. Fairy houses. People had built small houses for fairies to live in. And the sign says, you may build houses small and hidden for the fairies, but Please, do not use living or artificial materials. Do you know what artificial means? It means that it's made by humans. So anything that's plastic or glass or anything that is not natural or organic. I asked if I could build a fairy house. My dad said, yes as long as I follow the rules of the wood. We just talked about those rules. Only natural materials. I scouted out places that would be just right for a fairy house. I chose a hollow at the base of an oak tree and collected some twigs, some leaves, and pieces of bark to build with. I finished the inside with a floor of dry grass and made a roof with fallen leaves. I hoped the fairies would choose my house for a place to live in. The next morning, I couldn't wait to visit the woods again to see if anyone might be sleeping inside my house. When I bent down to look, I heard a chirp, chirp, chirping. Was a fairy snoring? Hey, you're not a fairy, I said. You're just a cricket. The cricket hopped off into a bush full of bright red berries. Hmm, maybe the fairies would like some to eat, I thought. I gathered a handful of berries from the ground and sprinkled them around my house. The following day, after visiting the lighthouse with my parents, I decided to check on my fairy house. A pair of finches were carrying the last berries away in their beaks. Searching the ground for more berries, I came to a small stream. The sound of the trickling water gave me an idea. I took some stones from my pack that I had found near the lighthouse and arranged them in a circle near my fairy house. Then I filled the circle with water from the stream 
in case the fairies got thirsty or wanted to take a bath. There are the finches sharing the berries. Anybody here? I whispered the next day. At first, the house looked empty. Then I spied someone in the pool. I wanted to get a closer look at the frog as he bathed. Oops! I guess I got too close. As the frog leaped away, I could hear other frogs singing out to him. I started singing myself as I got to work, collecting acorns and pine cones. It was time to make some home improvements. When I came back the next afternoon, I saw a squirrel nibbling on the nuts, but no fairies in sight. I just couldn't give up. I still hoped the fairies would visit my house. Maybe it needed a better entrance. In my pack were seashells and feathers my mom and I had found on the beach. I decorated the path leading up to the door. I thought about adding some shiny bracelets to one of the shells, hoping to catch a fairy's attention. But then I remembered the rules of the wood. Do you remember the rules of the wood? Should Kirsten use those bracelets? Mm, they're made by humans. You're not natural. The next morning, I got up very early when my parents were still asleep. My parents were still asleep and I tiptoed out of our cottage and into the woods. This was the day we would be leaving the island, so I had one last chance to visit my fairy house. What do you think? Is she going to see fairies this time? A fog had rolled in off the ocean, covering the woods like a thick blanket. I could barely see. I was, it was like walking through a cloud. The trees seemed huge, and their branches looked like arms reaching out to grab me. Goosebumps started popping out on my arms and legs. Someone was watching me, I was sure. Should I turn around and run? But my fairy house was so close. It was then that I heard footsteps, and saw a large, dark shape moving towards my fairy house. My heart started thumping. I jumped behind a tree to hide. Is it a fairy? I caught my breath. It was a deer licking the salty seashells. I stood perfectly still as she made her way lazily through the woods, then vanished into the mist. Exhausted, I sat down near my fairy house, watching, waiting, and wishing for fairies to appear. The quiet of the woods and the soft mist made me sleepy. My eyelids felt heavy but I tried not to fall asleep. Before long, the sun started breaking through the mist, and with it came a soft breeze. Kristen. The breeze seemed to whisper in my ear. Kristen, wake up. We can only stay for a moment. Struggling to open my eyes, I saw a bright beam of light in a tiny smiling face. We are the fairies who live in the spirits of all the plants and animals in these woods, a voice said. Of all the houses here, the animals have chosen yours to visit. 
You have treated the woods with care and respect. Look quickly, Kristen, for this is a moment of magic when the fairies will show themselves as a way of thanking you. As the late morning sun started breaking through the mist, light beams illuminated the fairies. They sparkled like jewels. They became so bright, I had to close my eyes. When I opened my eyes, the fairies had changed into beautiful monarch butterflies. Butterflies fluttered around me like a great orange cloud, following me to the edge of the woods where the sun shone brightly. I watched them dancing toward the light, higher and higher. Squinting into the warm golden day, I smiled and waved as the last butterfly disappeared into the sky. Was that a fantastic story, you guys? So we learned about respecting the forest and always using natural materials to build our fairy houses. And if you would like some inspiration for your own fairy houses, you should visit www.fairyhouses.com. And they posted a lot of pictures that kids have made of fairy houses in their own backyards or in the forest. So be creative. You can use items like leaves and sticks and twigs and um, uh, pine cones. Anything that you can find that's natural in the forest to make these fairy houses. But that's all very well for fairies who live in the forest. But what about household fairies? Household fairies like brownies and boggarts. Well, we're going to be learning about them in another reading later on of the Spiderwick Chronicles. But right now I'm going to show you another little craft that you can do indoors with artificial human-made crafting materials. So, let's do that. So, brownies are helpful household fairies. And you can make a house for a brownie using a brown paper bag. You can cut a door into that brown paper bag and cut a window. And then you fold over the top of the brown paper bag. Use a piece of construction paper Fold it lengthwise in half to make the roof. And then if you tape it or glue it just so, then you can lift up the roof and open up your house and you can fill it with furniture made from made materials or found materials. So we made a little chair here out of a egg carton with a little bit of glue. You could use corks, you could use bottle caps. And we made a little bed for a fairy. There's our fairy. And we just used some cotton balls and some leftover cloth to make a pillow for the fairy. A little strip of cloth to make a bedspread some cotton balls to make a mattress, and just some leftover recyclables to make the actual bed. So that's just a, a couple of examples of some furniture that you could make with um, regular old recyclable materials that you have lying around your house. You could make a, um, a fairy or a brownie very happy. <laughs> so. You can also make some fairies as well. Do you know, in 1917, 
Elsie Wright and Frances Griffiths, two girls, took photos of fairies in England. This is one of their photos. Were the fairies real? Many people thought so. Years later, the girls said that most of the pictures were fake. They had actually made their fairies out of paper and then taken their photos. And one of the people who actually believed that they were real was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of the Sherlock Holmes series. But there were some photos that they took that the girls could not explain. Were they real fairies? I don't know. But you can make your own fairies as well. So you've already seen one of the fairies that we made using clothespin. And we can put together um, some special little kits of specialty items that you might need to make some of these crafts. And you can email me at aldrichchildren at gmail.com if you would like to pick up one of these craft kits as part of curbside service. Um, or as part of a lunch program. Curb curbside service is Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, 10 to 2, up at the York Branch currently. And lunches are mon Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 11 to 1. So yeah, just drop me a line if you would like some craft materials, some specialty craft materials. But like I said, a lot of these crafts can be made with items that you have at home. So we used a wooden clothespin for this fairy and a little bit of crepe paper to make her dress. We just crimped it and used a little bit of a ribbon around her waist. And I would suggest making the dress first. And then you can add the wings. We used glitter paper. So we could cut those out and uh, send a little bit of glitter, glitter paper home with you in your kits. Um, just glue those glittery wings onto your fairy and then you can add a little bit of yarn for hair and we used a toothpick and a little bit of glitter paper to make a wand. There are other fairies that you can make as well. Let's take a look. There are more fairies to be found in our tree. Here we have a couple of our clothing, clothing pin fairies. And this one uses instead a popsicle stick and tracing paper as the uh, wings. Paper leaves for the dress and pipe cleaners or Chanel stems for the arms. And then if you have been watching my story times, my virtual story times, you will recognize this fairy made from a regular old plastic spoon. And we use once again tracing paper and color those trace that tracing paper to make the wings and yarn for the hair and added a crown and once again a toothpick for the magic wand. So just some ideas that you have there for making different types of fairies. All right, so uh, now we're going to make a little gnome to go in your garden. And we're using this modeling clay that's air dry. It's very, very light. But what you can do once you create your creation is put a little bit of Mod Podge over it. It'll make it somewhat weatherproof. Um, and then you can put it outside, or it'll be a little bit more permanent. And um, it hardens, so it's so still soft, but somewhat hard. <laughs> so, this stuff has a pretty nice consistency. I'm going to make a little head. This 
guy is going to have a longer nose than my first gnome. this nose there. Now I'll use a little bit of white for the beard. He's been growing it for some time. He's been in quarantine for a while. <laughs> the salons aren't open yet, you know? <laughs> okay, now we'll use a little bit of white to make another little ball just like we did for the head. This is going to be one of his eyeballs. So I'll put that aside, just like that. I'll do the same on the other side. As you can see, playing with modeling clay is really great for hand-eye coordination and fine motor skill development for kids. They get to experiment and they can be creative. So now I'm gonna make an even smaller ball in my palm. I think he needs a little smile too. So we'll just use a little bit of black. He's sort of a bemused smile. Okay, so now on to a hat. Okay, so I'll use some of this uh, nice little red here, and um, I'm going to roll that in my hands, just like we did actually with the nose. I'm going to twist it a little bit. Flatten the end. blue here to make the body of our gnome.
So then you can add the arms on and you could make some legs if you want to. But uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to have him just, you know, peering out of the grass, you know. So now you can put these little guys in the, in the grass once they're dried and once you've applied a little bit of um, Mod Podge to them. And uh, you'll have some buddies in your garden. Cerise, what do you think their names are? Um, one of them looks a little bit like the squirrel from Ice Age. Okay. So maybe Scrat for one of them. Scrat and Winston? Sure. Scrat and Winston. All right. Come on, Scrat. All right, Winston. Your nose looks funny. Well, so does yours. We're gnomes. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Adding a little bit of white for the beard. So this is acrylic paint that we're using on the rocks. Once it has dried, then you can apply the face using a Sharpie marker, a black Sharpie marker. Might be best to let the paint dry between colors so that you don't get the smudging of the white like I did. And then once you apply the um, once it's the paint has dried, you've applied the faces with a marker, then you can use Mod Podge, right, on top of it. Yep, and it'll set the colors. And that should make it somewhat weatherproof, so you'll be able to stick it right out in your garden. And now we have a gnome in our tree. Gnomes in our tree. Okay there, folks. And so now we're going to have a little reading from the Spiderwick Chronicles, Book One, The Field Guide, by Tony Ditterlizzi and Holly Black. The reading of this book is with permission from Simon and Schuster Limited Publishing. So, to recap, we're, we're starting in about the middle of the book. So, the main characters, Jared, Simon, and Mallory, have all moved into a new house, a creepy old house um, that was owned by an old relative from the Spiderwick family. And Jared has discovered a book called the Field Guide, Arthur Spiderwick's Field Guide, which is a field guide of different types of fairies that can be found. And so he's become very interested and obsessed with this book. And um, meanwhile, they've been hearing some strange sounds coming from inside the walls. And when they open up the wall, they find a nest hidden within the wall. They don't know what has created this nest, so they're trying to figure that out. So that's where we're uh, going to be starting off here. Are you going to read that all night? Simon asked. He was sitting on his side of the room. Jeffrey and Lemon Drop, the mice, were running around on the comforter, and his new tadpoles were set up in one of the fish tanks. So what if I do? Jared asked. With each crumbling page, Jared was learning strange facts. Could there really be brownies in his house? Pixies in his yard? Nixies in the stream out back? The book made them so real. He didn't want to talk to anyone right now, not even Simon. He just wanted to keep reading. I don't know, Simon said. I thought maybe you'd be bored by now. 
You don't usually like to read. Jared looked up and blinked. It was true. Simon was the reader. Jared mostly just got into trouble. He turned the page. I can read if I want to. Simon yawned. Uh, are you worried about falling asleep? I mean, about what happened tonight? What happened tonight? Look at this! Jared flipped to a page close to the front. There's this fairy called a brownie. Like Girl Scouts? I don't know, Jared said. Like this, look. He pushed the page in front of Simon. On the yellowed paper was an ink drawing of a little man posing with a feather duster made from a badminton birdie and a straight pin. Next to it was a hunched figure, also small, but this one held a piece of broken glass. What's with that? Simon pointed to the second figure, intrigued despite himself. This Arthur guy says it's a boggart. See, brownies are these helpful guys, but then if you make them mad, they go crazy. They start doing all these bad things and you can't stop them. They, then they become boggarts. That's what I think we have. You think we made it mad by messing up its house? Yeah, maybe. Or maybe it was kind of wacky before that. I mean, look at this guy. Jared pointed to the brownie. He's not the type to live in a skeevy house decorated with dead bugs. Simon nodded, looking at the pictures. Since you found the book in this house, he said, do you think that this is a picture of our Bogart? I never thought of that, Jared said quietly. It makes sense, though. Does it say in the book what we should do? Jared shook his head. He talks about different ways to catch it. Not catch it for real, but see it. Or get evidence. Jared, Simon sounded doubtful. Mom said to close the door and stay in here. The last thing she needs is another reason to believe that you were the one who attacked Mallory. But she thinks it was me anyway. If something happens tonight, she'll think it was me too. She won't. I'll tell her you were here all night. Besides, that way we can make sure nothing happens to either one of us. What about Mallory? Jared asked. Simon shrugged. I saw her getting into bed with one of her fencing swords. I wouldn't mess with her. <laughs> yeah, Jared got into bed and opened the book again. I'm just going to read a little more. Simon nodded and got up to put the mice back in their tanks. Then he got into bed and pulled the covers over his head with a mumble. Good night. As Jared read, each page took him deeper into the strange world of forest and stream, alive with creatures that seemed so close that he could almost stroke the slick, scaly flanks of the mermaids. He could almost feel the heat of the troll's breath and hear the rumble of the dwarven forges. When he turned the last page, it was late at night. Simon was bundled up so that Jared could only see the top of his head. Jared listened hard, but the only sounds in the house were the wind whistling through the roof above them and the water gurgling through the pipes. No scuttling or screaming. Even Simon's beasts were asleep. Jared flipped to the page that read, Boggart's delight in tormenting those that once they once protected and will cause milk to sour, doors to slam, dogs to go lame, and other malicious mischief. Simon believed him. Sort of, anyway. But Mallory and their mom wouldn't. And besides, he and Simon were twins. It almost didn't count for anything that Simon believed in. Jared looked at the suggestion of the book. Scattering sugar or flour on the floor is one way of obtaining footprints. If he had footprints to show, then they'd have to believe him. Jared opened the door and crept downstairs. It was dark in the kitchen, and everything was quiet. He tiptoed across the cool tile to where his mother had put the flour in an old glass apothecary jar on the countertop. 
He took out several handfuls and scattered them liberally on the floor. It didn't look like much. He wasn't sure how well footprints would show up in it. Maybe the bogger wouldn't even walk across the kitchen floor. So far, it seemed to stick to moving through the walls. He thought about he, what he knew about boggarts from the book. Malicious. Hateful. Hard to get rid of. If their brownie form, in their brownie form, they were helpful and nice. They did all kinds of work for a plain old bowl of milk. Maybe. Jared went over to the fridge and poured milk into a small saucer. Maybe if he left it out, the creature would be tempted to come out of the walls and leave footprints as a flower. But when he looked at the saucer of milk there on the floor, he couldn't help feeling a little bit bad, a little bit weird at the same time. In the first place, it was weird that he was down here setting a trap for something that he didn't even know if he would have ever believed in two weeks ago. But the reason he felt bad was, well, he knew what it was like to be mad. And he knew how easy it was to get into a fight, even if you were really mad at someone else. And he thought that just maybe that was how the bugger felt. But then he noticed something else. He left footprints of his own in the flower, all the way from the milk back to the hall. Crud, he muttered as he went to get the broom. The light cracked on. Jared Grace! It was his mother's voice coming from the top of the stairs. Jared turned fast, but he knew how guilty he looked. Get back to bed, she said. I was just trying to catch. But she didn't let him finish. Now, mister, go. After he thought about it for a minute, he was glad that she interrupted him. His bugger idea probably wouldn't have been a big hit. With a look back over his shoulder at the flower dusting the floor, Jared slunk up the stairs. Jared rolled over at the sound of his mother's voice. She was angry. Jared, you better get up. What's going on? Jared asked sleepily, peering up from the covers. For a second, he thought he missed school, until he remembered they moved, and not even so much as set foot in the new school yet. Up, Jared, his mother said. You want to pretend you don't know? Fine. Let's go downstairs so you can see what's going on. The kitchen was a mess. Mallory had a broom and was sweeping up broken pieces of a porcelain bowl. The walls were painted with chocolate syrup and orange juice. Raw eggs oozed down the window panes. Simon was sitting at the kitchen table. His arms were covered with the same bruises Mallory had been wearing only a day before. And his eyes were red-rimmed, like he'd been crying. Well, his mother asked expectantly. I... I didn't do this, Jared said, looking around at them. They couldn't really believe he would do something like this, could they? There on the floor of the kitchen, next to the drifts of cereal and scattered pieces of orange peel, Jared saw small tracks in the flower. They were the size of his little finger, and he could clearly see the imprint of a heel of a foot and a feathering in the front that might have been from toes. Look, Jared said, pointing. See, little footprints. Mallory looked up at him, and her eyes were narrowed with fury. Mallory looked up at him, and her eyes were narrowed with fury. Just shut up, Jared. Mom says she saw you down here last night. You made those footprints. I did not, Jared yelled back. Why don't you look in the freezer then, huh? What? Jared asked. Simon gave an especially wet-sounding sob. Their mother took the broom from Mallory's hand and started sweeping up the flour and cereal. Mom, no! The footprints, Jared said. But his mother didn't pay any attention to him. Two strokes of the broom, and the only proof he had was swept into a pile of rubbish. Mallory opened the freezer door. Each of Simon's tadpoles was frozen into a single cube in the tray. Next to them, 
was a note written in ink on a piece of a cereal box. Not very nice to ice the mice. And Jerry and Lemon Drop are gone, said Simon. Now why don't you tell us what you did with your brother's mice, said his mother. Mom, I didn't do it. I really didn't. Mallory gripped Jared by the shoulder. I don't know what you think you're doing, but you're about to start regretting it. Mallory, their mother cautioned, his sister, let go, but the look she gave him carried the promise of later violence. I don't think that Jared did it, said Simon, between sniffs. I think it was the Boggart. Their mother said nothing. The look on her face said that manipulating Simon was the worst thing Jared had done. Jared, she said, start taking this trash out to the front. If you thought this was funny, let's see how funny you think it is when you spend the rest of today cleaning it up. Jared hung his head. He had no way of making her believe him. Silently, he got dressed, then gathered up three black garbage bags and started dragging them toward the front of the house. Outside, the weather was warm and the sky was blue. The air smelled of pine needles and freshly mown grass, but daylight didn't seem to be any comfort at all. One of the bags snagged on a branch, and when Jared tugged, the plastic ripped. Groaning, he dropped the bags and surveyed the damage. The tear was large, and most of the garbage had spilled out. As he started to gather things up, he realized what he was, what he was holding. The contents of the creature's house. He looked at the worn bits of cloth, the doll's head, and the pins with pearl tops. In the daylight, there were other things he had not noticed before. There had been a robin's egg, but it was crushed. Tiny slips of newspaper were scattered throughout, each one with a different strange word on it. Luminous read one. Soliloquy read another. Gathering up all the pieces of the nest, Jared put them carefully aside from the rest of the trash. Could he make a new house for the Boggart? Would it matter? Could that stop it? He thought about Simon crying, and about the poor stupid tadpoles frozen in ice cubes. He didn't want to help the Boggart. He wanted to catch it and kick it and make it sorry it ever came out of the wall. Dragging the rest of the bags to the front lawn, he looked at the pile of the Boggart's things, still not sure whether he was going to burn them or give them back or what. He carried them inside. I'm going to skip, skip a couple of pages here. I really need your help, said Jared. His brother and sister were lying on the rug in front of the television. Each one had a controller, and from where he was standing, could see colors flit across their faces as the screen changed. Mallory snorted but didn't reply. Jared looked as that took that as a positive response. At this point, anything that didn't involve fists was a positive response. I know you think I did it, Jared said, opening the book to the page about Boggarts. But well, honest, I didn't. You heard the thing in the walls. There was the writing on the desk and the footprints in the flower. And remember the nest? Remember how you guys pulled everything out of that nest? Mallory stood up and snatched the book out of his hands. Hey, give it back, Jared pleaded, making a grab for it. Mallory held it over her head. This book is what started all the trouble. No, Jared said. That's not true. I got the book after your hair was knotted. Give it back, Mallory, please, give it back. Now she held it in two hands, one on either side of the open book, poised to rip it apart. Mallory, no, no! Jared was nearly speechless with panic. If he didn't think of something quick, the book was going to be in pieces. Wait, Mal, Simon said, getting up from the floor. Mallory waited. What help did you want, Jared? Jared took a deep breath. I've been thinking that if our messing up the nest is what got it upset, maybe we could make it a new nest. I... I took a birdhouse and put some stuff in it. I thought, well, 
I thought that maybe the bugger was a little bit like us. Because it's stuck here too. I mean, maybe it doesn't even want to be here. Maybe being here makes it mad. Okay, before I say I believe you, Mallory said, holding the book in a less threatening position. Tell me exactly what you want us to do. I need you guys to work the dumbwaiter, Jared said, so I can bring the house up to the library. I thought it would be safe there. Let's see this house, Mallory said. She and Simon followed Jared into the hall, and he showed it to them. It was made from a wooden birdhouse large enough for a crow to roost in. Jared had found it among the ones hung in the attic. Sliding up the back, he showed them how he had arranged everything, except the cockroaches, neatly inside. On the walls, he had taped up the newspaper words, and also a few small pictures from magazines. Did you cut up Mom's stuff to make that? Simon asked. Yeah, Jared said, and shrugged. Yeah, you really did a lot of work, Mallory said. So you'll help me? Jared wanted to ask for the book back, but he didn't want to make his sister mad all over again. Mallory looked at Simon and nodded. I want to go first, though, said Simon. Jared hesitated. Sure, he said. Well, folks, I hope that you enjoyed that reading from the Spiderwick Chronicles, and hopefully you were inspired by some of those crafts that we made. Hopefully you'll make some fairy crafts of your own at home, and we would love to see some pictures of the crafts that you make. So if you're comfortable, go ahead and upload some pictures of your crafts to our Facebook page. Uh, can't wait to see your creativity and imagination at work. Well, if you enjoyed the Spiderwick Chronicles and you want to hear more uh, of the story, you can check out the book um, through Curbside Service. We have um, paper copies of the book, and the audiobook is also available on Overdrive. Uh, it is read by Mark Hamill, who is the actor who plays Luke Skywalker in the Star Wars movies. So it's really fantastic. Um, and also, uh, the film... The Spiderwick Chronicles is still available on Netflix, I believe. And you can compare the film, the movie, to the book. Really enjoyable. Well, I hope that you enjoyed those stories. And um, we will see you in some other virtual story times and virtual programs um, throughout the summer. So stay tuned. There'll be other programs coming up on our YouTube channel. Bye for now.